Good evening and welcome to Tuesday, January 22nd, 2013, Board of Education meeting. And t tonight, Mr. Mendez will be clerk pro tem as Mrs. Burns is joining us teleconference this evening at 190 Roberta in Hendersonville, Tennessee. Hello. Good evening, Mrs. Burns. And we just opened and we'll do roll call, please. President Schmidt? Here. Thank you. And could we have the flag salute, please? All right. Will everyone please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you. And since it's been a while since we've been here, I'd like to remind the board members to please click your microphone on before making comments so that it will get recorded. And the same for student board members. And tonight will be all roll call votes. And from closed session, we have a report from Mrs. Elzig. Thank you. First of all, the board voted in closed session with a 5-0 vote to accept the resignation agreement of employee number 136773. Secondly, we have good news tonight. The board voted with a 5-0 vote to accept Luis, or excuse me, appoint Luis Murillo as the principal of adult alternative education at the Learning Center. Congratulations, Luis. Thank you, and now we'll start with the welcome and the 2012-13 student board members, Mr. Duchon. Well, thank you. I forgot our order. Do you it's have? Roger. Roger is first. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone had a great holiday break. I know I did. Um, first of all, I'd like to start off by. Congratulating Ms. Garza Gonzalez is being promoted as the administrator of the, um, the administrative services in the district, I believe, and welcoming Mr. Mr. Um, Michael West as our new principal at Herpa Valley High School. We hope to see great things from him, and we are glad to have him. Well, currently in sports, we've been doing great, except for our girls' water polo. Um, they're not doing as well. But our girls' soccer, our 4 0 in league, 10, 3, and 2 overall. Our girls' basketball is 19 and 1 overall, 4 0 in league. Our boys' basketball is 16 and 3 overall, 4 0 in league. And our boys' soccer is 7, 4, and 1 overall, 2, 1, and 1 over league. Wrestling is 1 and 2 overall, and league is in league, they are 0 and 2. So that places our girls' soccer, girls' basketball, boys' basketball, all in first in league. And our boys', our boys soccer in second in league. And last week, um, when we competed against Patriot, we won all of our games, except wrestling. But besides that, we did excellent. And unfortunately, Shaylee isn't here to acknowledge that. <laughs> and um, this week, we kicked off our Spirit Week at Harupa Valley High School. Today, we kicked it off with Two Bright Tuesday. Everyone sported their neon colors and sunglasses. Tomorrow is What You're Looking At Wednesday. So we're dressing wild and crazy, something to get everyone's attention. Thursday is Throwback Thursday, so we're dressing in all of our old school clothes, back at, like when we were babies. And f Friday is Class Series, which are um, our theme of our pep rally is Animation Domination, and therefore each class has um, donned a, a cartoon channel. Our freshmen are Boomerang, our sophomores are Cartoon Network, our juniors are Disney Channel, and our seniors are Nickelodeon. And um, in upcoming events, uh, February 4th, we ki our ASB kicks off its Pennies for Patients drive, which collects money for leukemia patients. And our Sadies is under construction by our ASB when that's scheduled for uh, um, February, February 15th, I believe. And we just received news that our gym is being renovated towards March. And we like to thank you for that, for our new air conditioning system. And we also kind of are hindered by it because our ASB spring pep rally won't be able to occur in the gym. So we got to think outside the box, and thanks for giving us more work. 
And that is all for tonight. Well, thank you. We planned that on purpose. We looked at the ASB schedule and thought if we could mess up one date, we would do that. No, we, we actually, I think we're trying to work with basketball season, but it'll be nice um, recalling the many awards that are, sometimes it gets a little bit warm in the spring, so it'll be pretty nice. Ariana, how about Rubido High School? Hello everyone, now that second semester is in full swing, our Falcons are back hard at work and for our lower classmen, registration for the 2013-2014 school year has also begun and for our seniors, this Wednesday night is Justin Senior Family Night in our cafeteria along with the Free Cash for College workshop on Thursday the 24th from 6 to 8. Um, with an opportunity to win an extra $1,000 scholarship, Parents are welcome and are encouraged to come attend. This past Monday, our band had the great opportunity to perform in the Disney Parade at Disneyland, and they did a spectacular job. Um, last Friday, all four of our basketball teams were victorious against Rim of the World, and both of our varsity soccer teams are in position for playoffs. And our competitive cheer squad will also be holding tryouts the first few weeks of February. And I'm happy to say next week is our MORP, which is prom backwards. And the festivities will kick off with our spirit days. And our theme is Battle of the Sexes, Battle for Universal Dominance. And our rally will be held February 1st. And our Blacklight MORP dance is on Friday night from 8 to 1130. Um, we're expecting it to be one of the best dances Rubido has ever had, because ASP has been putting a lot of hard work and we're excited for an amazing turnout. And we're also getting our gym renovated and have to do our spring rally outside. But thank you for giving us air conditioning. Thank you both for your presentations regarding the high schools. And next we'll move on to recognition and recognize Ann Cox, Mira Loma Middle School teacher, Mr. Jabrowski. Thank you. Each year, the California League of Middle Schools recognizes outstanding middle school teachers. On December 10th, Ms. Ann Cox, Mary Loma Middle School teacher, was recognized as a finalist for Region 10, which consists of middle schools from Riverside, Inyo Mono, and San Bernardino County. Ms. Cox has been with the district since 1987 and currently teaches math at Mary Loma Middle School. And, and I've had a lot of opportunities to see her teach over the years, and she is a fantastic teacher and a high-quality person, so we congratulate her. And she is sitting back there in the back row. I noticed she didn't even stand. <laughs> and next we'll recognize the Macy's District Grant recipient, Van Buren Elementary School, Mr. Jabrowski. Thank you, Chuck Loving, Van Buren Elementary School teacher, has been notified that his fourth grade class will be receiving a grant award from Macy's in the amount of $1,642 to sponsor a field trip to Mission San Juan Capistrano in May. That's information only. Thank you. And next, we'll recognize the best of the best for November and December with Employee Recognition Program, Mrs. Rausch. Well, Happy New Year to all of you. Can't believe that uh, I'm standing here reverting backwards because we're recognizing our best of the best for November and December. And so a couple of our winners I see are here. So as I call your name and uh, getting ready to read your script, if you can come forward. Um, I don't see Vern Grissom here tonight but I'm gonna tell you a little bit about him. Vern is um, one of our, ca or our campus supervisor at Ina Arbuckle um, Elementary School. He's a very conscientious employee and takes great pride in providing supervision of the Ina Arbuckle campus. He has a positive influence on campus and keeps the morale of students and staff upbeat. Staff can always count on Vern to stop whatever he's doing if they are in need of assistance. Vern consistently consistently displays a smile for all, which can turn a bad day into a good day for someone. We'd like to thank Vern for being a hardworking and dedicated staff member at Ina Arbuckle. 
And our next one is our beloved Jack Johnson, and I don't think he's here. Jack is our head custodian at the Ed, Ed Center and our maintenance and operations department. No words can describe the appreciation that staff at the Ed Center has for Jack. Jack is the only head custodian that we've ever known here at the Ed Center. He provides thorough and courteous service to all staff and the public who frequent this building. Jack doesn't hesitate to stop what he's doing if someone needs his assistance, and he always does this with a smile. And again, we'd like to thank Jack for um, his dedication and willingness to go the extra mile for us here at the Ed Center and for our maintenance and operations department. Our next recipient is Chloe Arias. I think she's here. Chloe is described by her coworkers as a dedicated, compassionate, and inspiring teacher who values and works tirelessly, uh, tirelessly to provide the best instruction to her students. In her role as data team leader, Chloe collects, interprets, and presents data in an organized and useful way to her colleagues. Chloe is a remarkable educator who sees every day as an opportunity to influence her students' lives and futures. Thank you, Chloe, for being such a dedicated and hardworking member of our family. Um, next, we have Julia Quinto, fifth grade teacher at Rustic Lane Elementary School. Julia's not here tonight, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about her. On a daily basis, Julia strives to engage her students through unique instruction techniques. She has created a Scrabble Club to provide a challenge and build knowledge for Gates students. Julia is also very involved in the school community. She has organized the student council, several PTO fundraisers, and has assisted in movie night and the school's craft fair. Julia is a terrific person and educator, and staff and students appreciate her positive influence that she brings to the Rustic Lane family. We'd like to congratulate Julia to, uh, tonight. Next, we have our first manager, Kasal Chia. <laughs> Kasal is our principal at Sunny Slope Elementary School, and in the short amount of time that Kasal has been part of the Sunny Slope family, he has already made an impact. He has established positive relationships with staff, students, and parents. Kasal can often be seen on the playground playing basketball and interacting with students. He is a compassionate and fair leader, and his genuine care and concern for the Sunny Slope community is greatly appreciated by all. The Harupa Unified School District is so lucky that Casal has joined our family, and we'd like to congratulate him tonight. <laughs> Last but not least is our Jeff Lewis, Network Manager in the Technology Department. Jeff has only been a manager for a short period of time and has already proven to be an effective leader. His willingness to assist others, positive attitude, and computer network knowledge is greatly appreciated, appreciated by all staff. Jeff listens to user concerns and displays a patient and kind attitude when assisting them with their computer issues. I know firsthand. I'm not a computer guru. He is. In addition, Jeff's strong work ethic and excellent communication skills make him an integral part of the technology department. Thank you, Jeff, for all you do, and congratulations. <laughs> Last but not least are all of our um, honorable mentions, and so if they're here tonight, if they could just please stand at their seat when I call their name. Michael Dumeyer, Computer Support Assistant, Technology Department. Allison Hernandez, Secretary Account Clerk, Maintenance and Operations. Shirley Morales, Barcelona Translator Clerk, Typist, Administrative Services. Maria Munoz, Translator Clerk, Typist, Van Buren. Allison T. Garden, Secretary Account Clerk, Maintenance and Transportation. 
John Allen, Teacher on Special Assignment, Ed Services. <laughs> Laura Barnes, SDC Teacher, Mission Middle. <laughs> David O'Rafferty, PE Teacher, Harupa Middle. <laughs> John Parker, Math Teacher, Mariloma Middle. <laughs> and finally, Kim Regua Avila, AVID Teacher, Harupa Valley. And thank you and congratulations to all our staff recognized tonight. Thank you, Mrs. Roush, and congratulations to each and every one of you. Next, we'll move to public verbal comment. And each, and it does not appear that we have any pink slips for tonight. Is there anyone that managed to make public verbal comments? Seeing none, we will move on to administrative reports and written communications. And review of the significant disproportionality coordinated early intervening services plan, Mr. Dabrowski. That's a mouthful, huh? While that's starting up, we're going to talk tonight about significant disproportionality, a term that I learned about over the last few months, um, what that means for us and what we'll do. We will actually bring forward a plan to you at the following board meeting. So tonight it's more of a, just an introduction and some background information, and then at the next meeting we'll bring the plan to you for approval. So significant disproportionality. Where that term comes from is the, the CDE monitors the numbers of students we have in special education. They monitor it by disability and by subgroup. So for example, if we're talking about students with learning disabilities, they look at the percentage of, of white students, of English learner students, of African American students, and how many of those, what our general population percentage is, and what percentage we've identified as having that disability. So they look at every disability category that we serve, and all of our significant subgroups, and, and what percentage of students we have that fall into those categories. When it becomes disproportionate, and, and it could be over-representation or under, although the state is really only looking at over at this time, um, is when we are over-represented in a particular subgroup in a particular disability category. And that's the situation we found ourselves in. Based on the data from 2010-11, we were notified this past fall that we are significantly disproportionate in the amount of students, white students, who are identified with the disability of emotionally disturbed. Um, which, which put us in an interesting position because typically the, the monitoring process is put in place to serve um, what you would consider historically underserved or underachieving populations, like our, our English learner population. So this, um, it, it, it put us in a bind. We had to kind of think about it for a little bit and um, look at you know, the causes and, and start figuring out why this happened and what we need to do about it. The requirements set forth um, by the CDE for us to, to look at this is first to convene what's called a leadership group, which is the Ed Services Director and Cabinet, and take a look at um, the state provided several instruments that we could choose from to analyze our data, to ask pointed questions about um, you know, what's going on and why are we in this situation, and to um, determine the makeup of the, the next group, the stakeholders group. We also worked with a, an external assistance provider, Dennis Doyle, a former superintendent from San Diego, who has been authorized by the CDE to, to help districts through this process. Um, after that, we convened a stakeholders group, which is a, a larger group that spent a day looking at those questions and looking at the data. The stakeholder group was over around 40 people, represented um, classified staff, represented teachers, both special and regular education teachers, uh, site level administration, district level administration. President Schmidt was a, was a member of that group. 
And also we, we pulled from outside of the district some groups that we work with like SELPA, um, like Spectrum, the group that serves some of our emotionally disturbed students and our COE to make sure that we got a good representation of, of our district and people with that expertise so that we could really take a look at um, what the data told us about why we have this overrepresentation and what we could do about it. So we, we first began by looking at the data. We went through a series of questions that looked at programmatic elements, looked at educational elements, looked at the population of our district, and really asked a lot of questions about why might this be happening. And then we chose a focus area, which is an area that we would implement to, um, to work on improving the situation. And the focus area that we chose was Positive Behavior Intervention and Support, or PBIS. And that is um, uh, something that really focuses on looking at students' behavior um, and looking at intervening proactively and providing services and supports for kids who may be at risk, or for all kids, who may be at risk of, of having behavior difficulties. So that rather than responding to behavior, um, we're, we're proactively looking at it. And also looking at it from a skill deficit model. For example, I know as a, as a young teacher, when I, when I looked at whether students could read or couldn't read, often I looked at it, if a student couldn't read, it was a deficit in skills. It was something that I needed to work on improving. But at the same time, when it came to behavior, I looked at it as a choice that the student was making. And, and so my efforts in improving behavior were aimed at helping that student to make a better choice. Um, and while that works for many students, there are students who we really need to look at it the same way we look at academic deficits. They need instruction and teaching and assistance in learning how to make the right choice rather than just being convinced to make the right choice. So positive behavior really takes a look at all of those aspects uh, and school cultures. And so that was what we chose as a group as our focus area. And then we began to write the plan that is um, nearly ready to go to the CDE, and, like, and you don't have that plan attached today, but it will be at the next board meeting. We submit the plan to the board for approval. After it's approved, it goes to CDE. Um, actually, it's, it's, it's already been sent up to CDE for a preliminary review, but pending board approval. And then we're required to set aside 15% of our idea or our special ed funds to provide early intervening services, which are services to help students who are at risk of becoming emotionally disturbed or labeled as emotionally disturbed to be successful. Did you have a question? David, yeah. Uh, what is CDE's uh, definition of being emotionally disturbed? Oh gosh, that's, that's Michelle? What are we looking at here and what, what, what is, how do you plan something? And where did this data come from? How do they know we have a bunch of white students that are emotionally disturbed? The state has all of our demographic, demographic data. They know all of our students. They know their ethnicities. And when they're identified for special ed and, and are given an IEP, they also get all that information as well. So they're able to pull all that information for all the students across the state, across the country. Um, so then we, we begin to implement our plan. The elements that are in the plan are this positive behavior intervention and support, like I mentioned, the reaching individual success in education or RISE program, which is a program that we're implementing that will at every school site support students who are at risk behaviorally, who are not to the level where they've been identified for special education, but we see that potentially they could get there. And so we're going to um, provide some services and some interventions for those students so that they can hopefully get on track and make better choices and be successful um, academically and behaviorally and not need that assessment or need those special ed services down the line. 
We've also implemented and are implementing a review process. So whenever uh, a school site student study team gets together and a referral for special ed assessment is made, we take a second look at that at the, at the um, special ed department and take a look at all of the interventions that have been put in place for that student. Just make sure we haven't left anything, make sure we haven't missed anything, make sure we've done everything we could prior to that assessment. And then in spring, we will reconvene with the stakeholder group again and monitor the progress that we've made um, based on the things that they identified at their meeting and what went into our plan and just kind of take a regular biannual look at how we're doing um, towards making these outcomes. And over time, the outcomes that we're looking for are, as you might have guessed, a decline in referrals for special education, particularly for students of emotional disturbance, a decline in the number of suspensions and expulsions, um, an increase in the number of students who are receiving interventions, and a positive evaluation of that RISE program um, at each campus, and then a positive evaluation of the professional development that we provide. For example, this Friday, teams from all of our schools will be attending the first day of the positive behavior support training. That'll be provided by Gail Angus from the SELPA and some others. And we'll be going through those in teams, learning about what positive behavior is, what the elements are, and, and meeting as a team to start thinking about what on each campus we can do to begin uh, implementing those strategies. Now, as I mentioned, um, our initial notification in the fall was based on 10-11 data. That's two years ago. So we were recently notified that we continue to be disproportionate based on the 11-12 data, obviously, because we couldn't do anything about it. Um, next year, we'll find out how we do on this year's data, and we're halfway through this year. So the, unfortunately, the data that they use, is it sort of lags behind a good little bit. Um, but, but we plan to make these changes over the next several months and continue to make them along the way and, and over time reduce these numbers and provide supports for not only our potentially special ed students, but for all of our students that struggle on any level behaviorally. Just a quick question. Um, what, in terms of numbers, what were the actual figures? I mean, how far out of line were we? I wouldn't imagine probably very much. Well, you know, the, the calculation system they use doesn't lend itself to easy understanding. There, there were two separate calculations that they use, and uh, I don't know, Michelle, maybe you can explain just a little bit about the calculation. And then uh, following up on Mr. Schaefer's uh, comment earlier, we have been using the same criteria that we've been, you know, for identifying students in this category, correct? And, and our hope really is that we don't believe there's anything wrong with the assessment evaluation process. We, we feel that we're, we're utilizing that process correctly. Where we hope we can intervene is before that, when the behavior is at a lower level and hasn't sort of elevated to the point where we get here. We're hoping if we can provide more support and services here, then we can prevent that from happening. That makes a lot of sense. It's very similar again to the SST process that was instituted for uh, special education in general that uh, once we began to identify, over identify students into the program to take proactive intervention practices um, and maybe prevent many of those students from, winding to, from needing to then be um, needing to have those services. And, and to draw the parallel, we, we do this very effectively for students with academic deficits. We just need to become more effective at doing it for students with behavior deficits. And that RISE program will work in conjunction with and parallel with our SSTs, just, just as you mentioned. Mr. Schaefer? As far as funds, where do the funds come from? And do we know how the amount? 
It's the amount is 15% of our Individuals with Disability Education Act funds, which are federal special ed funds. It, it equates to somewhere in the rough neighborhood of 400 some thousand dollars. It's a reallocation of funds that we're already getting. We're already so getting. we have to kind of take a look and in this, you know, tight fiscal times, we're trying to be very responsible fiscally with that and not expend new funds. Um, but it does provide that mechanism for it. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Next will be the review of the GASB 45 requirements and actuary report for other post-employment benefits, OPEB. Mr. Gill. Yes, ma'am. This is a requirement that's been around since 2007, 2008 year, where we need to take a look at the benefits that are provided other than the retirement benefits, but specifically health care benefits for our people. And we have uh, a requirement uh, or a benefit where people who have been with us for 10 years and retire at the age of 50 for PERS employees and 55 for STRS are eligible for health and welfare benefits at the same rate as active employees until they reach age 65. The district, like most other districts, is on a pay-as-you-go basis. GASB 45, uh, however, looks at what the total liability would be for all retirees and those who would reach retirement age. The pay-as-you-go expense that we budget each year, this particular year for 12-13, is $1,125,188. Every two years, we have an actuarial firm take a look at our total liability, it's, it's almost as though a way to explain it if we'd, if we'd fold up our doors and how much do we owe our retirees and that amounts to about $25 million as an unfunded liability and if we took all of the active employees it would rise to $40 million. We don't budget for that, it would be very expensive to do that, so we continue to do the pay as you go. Um, system and we are in compliance by doing that. So the current report of actuarial valuation as of July 1st, 2012 conducted on behalf of Haripa Unified by the Epler Company is in compliance with GASB 45 and is presented to the board in the supporting documents for information only. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Girl. Any questions? Next, we'll move on to notification of open enrollment period. Mr. Gill. Yes, ma'am. This is to notify the board and the public that parents will be notified beginning the 1st of February of the school's of choice open enrollment policy and procedures. A copy of the parents' information brochure is included in the supporting documents. Thank you. And next is the Williams Settlement Quarterly Uniform Complaint Report Summary. Mr. Duchamp. And there are none, so I have none to summarize. Thank you very much. And any other administrative reports and written communications? One brief one. Mr. Dubrowski would like to bring something to the board's attention. I do, and I want to start by defining it. The term long-term English learner, as you know, when our students enter our school speaking a language other than English, if they are not proficient in English, they are labeled as, a long, as an English learner. There's an expectation that students become fluent in English and proficient academically and are then reclassified and are no longer an English learner in a matter of four to five years. For students who remain classified as an English learner for five years or greater, they're, they're considered long-term English learners. And so they're sort of an at-risk population that we want to target and support. Um, so Harupa Unified will be recognized at RCOE's Long-Term English Learner Institute next week for accelerating the language de development of our long-term English learners. We had the second largest percentage point in increase in long-term English learners. Um, for math in Riverside County over a three-year period from 9-10 to the present. Um, the Institute is at the Riverside Marriott on next Tuesday the 29th and immediately following lunch Dr. Karen Cadiero Kaplan, the Director of English Learner Support Division at California Department of Ed and Diana Sire, Assistant Superintendent from our COE, will present the district the Long-Term English Learner Award. Thank you very much for that information. 
Next, we'll move on to the action session. And before we approve the consent calendar, I do have a couple of corrections to make. On item A8, page two, box three, should have the dates 2008 slash 2009. And on the resolution page at the bottom of A8, page one, should have where it has September 4th, 2007, should read January 22nd, 2013. And on A10, page one, it should read, the correction on that page should read 88, for Indian Hills, should read 8812 through 52313. And corrected documents were provided to the public on the back table. With that, I'm looking for an approval of routine action items by consent, items A1 through 11. I make a motion to approve. I have a motion by Ms. and a second. Did you have a question, Ms. Burns? No, I just wanted to make sure that you mo uh, motion with, with your- With motion. corrections, yes. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. I make the motion to approve as amended. Thank you. Second. second. All right, roll call vote, please. President Schmidt? Yes. Christy Burns? Yes. Christy Mendez? Yes. Christy Schaefer? Yes. Christy Burns? Yes. Student board Do you approve as amended? Thank you. Item B, consider and take action to grant or deny the charter petition for the establishment of the Tom Wathen Center Big Picture Aviation Academy. Mr. Duchon. Thank you, President Schmidt. You have before you a petition for, as you just read, the establishment of the Tom Watham Center Big Picture Aviation Academy. Um, you held a public hearing at, my goodness, last year, and at which time you took public input. In the interim, um, staff from fiscal services, ed services, personnel services, and myself reviewed the petition thoroughly and met with attorney Dina Harris and Dina turned the comments of staff into the legal document and Dina is here tonight to present the process and the findings which were essentially derived by staff and then turned into a legal document. Correct Dina? Did I get that right? <laughs> Thanks. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it, just to maybe add what um, Mr. Dushan said is that it's a typical process whenever I review one of these charter petitions is to have a team um, at the district in all areas of uh, expertise, the academic side, the budget side, um, special ed, um, personnel, and myself um, come together and having reviewed the various parts, talk about what the concerns are. And, you know, um, my job is to take those concerns and put them into um, and compare them what the legal standard is for approving a charter petition and to present that to you. And that's what I've done in this report. Um, I'm not going to go over every detail here. I know that you have it before you and you have read it, but I do want to just kind of summarize or highlight some of the, the comments. Um, it does in the first page, sec page or two, summarize what the legal standard is. Um, Okay, is this better? Okay, I will talk more um, clearly and loudly into the mic. Um, the board ha has the option of either granting a charter petition or denying a charter petition. If it chooses to deny it, it has to be based on specific findings of fact that are um, match up with the, what the law says. And in this case, um, you know, there's five basically um, grounds to deny. One is that the charter school presents an unsound educational program, That's, this is what the law says, um, two, that the petitioners are demonstrably unlikely to successfully implement the program that's outlined in the charter. Another reason is if it doesn't contain certain affirmations that are required by law. And another one is that if, and this is kind of where the bulk of the review takes place, if it does not contain reasonably comprehensive descriptions of 16 different elements um, that have to do with running a public school. And those range from the educational program, um, how measurable pupil outcomes and how those will be measured, 
um, employee qualifications, health and safety pr procedures, any admission requirements, student discipline, um, dispute resolution, and it goes on and on. There's actually 16 of those. Uh, governance structure is one of them as well. And so we go through each of those and look to see whether there's reasonably comprehensive descriptions in each of those such that the staff feels comfortable recommending approval because there is, um, it believes it's a sound educational program and then there's enough detail in there to have a picture of what's going to, what this charter school is going to look like. Um, one thing to remember is that a charter school is exempt from most laws in the education code, most of the provisions. Um, that's why they have greater flexibility. Um, it encourages, you know, innovation and all these other things. The other side of that is they have to comply with the terms of their charter. That becomes their governing document. They are not required to comply with many of these ed code requirements, but they are required to comply with everything as set forth in their charter. And so that's why it becomes important that those things be set forth in detail in their charter. Otherwise, no one's really clear on what the rules are, what they're governed by, and so forth. So that's just kind of the, the, the background. Um, in going through the concerns that staff had, I came up with um, several findings of fact that I believe that the board, if it chooses, has the ability to adopt those findings of fact and then deny the charter petition because of the deficiencies that were identified in the charter petition. Um, one had to do with the area of um, whether they were likely, unlike, or likely or unlikely to successfully implement the program. And one concern there was the budget. The budget doesn't contain a lot of um, assurances regarding where the source of funding is coming from. It relies on a, heavily on fundraising and donations, but doesn't give any kind of detail about or assurances of how that is going to actually take place. And typically when you're developing a budget, you don't want to develop it on information that is, um, or revenues that are speculative or even, um, you know, may or may not come in. So that's one concern that, that the district had about the budget. There were some other things like the, the cash flow didn't match or didn't um, correlate with the state deferral schedule. There were concerns that the expenses were low co compared to what the district's experience um, is with respect to some of these costs. So that was one area. Another area is that um, when we look at reasonably comprehensive descriptions of those 16 areas, um, some of the areas that we focused on here, one was the educational program. The charter petition talks a lot about goals and visions and kind of their, their um, ideas, what their goal, you know, what their plan is in broad terms, but it really lacks detail. I mean, we really started looking through, well, how is this gonna work? Yes, they're gonna meet, you know, have A through G classes for all their students, but how are they gonna do that with the limited number of teachers? How are they gonna have all those limited number of teachers be highly qualified in all of the courses that, are, that they're saying they're gonna provide to these high school students? Um, how are the internships going to work? Um, it's a very unique and innovative type of um, structure. It has an advisory, a, an advisor that's assigned to the student. Um, but it's unclear, is that a teacher? And are they quali highly qualified in all the areas that that advisor is going to be assisting the student in? Um, so how do they satisfy all these requirements? So there, it raised more questions than it answered, I guess is one way to put it. Um, it sounded like, you know, in concept, it sounded like a um, a fine idea, it's just the details were not there, and that caused concern um, from the academic standpoint, from the educational program perspective. Um, this goes into a number of areas. One is how they would serve English learners. There was very little detail on how they planned to do that and whether they would have teachers that satisfied the credential requirements for that. Um, another area is special education. There was very little detail, almost none, about how they would plan to serve special education students other than to say that they would um, basically either work with the district or contract with the district service providers. Um, you would normally expect to see something much more of a plan laid out as to how, they, how special education students would be served. Um, there was also lack of detail in um, assessments and methods of measurement. In the governance section, there were concerns I had, this is more my side, I mean, I, I'm not the academic expert, um, but from the governance standpoint, it contained um, information that was a concern to me because charter schools are public entities and they are subject to many, most of the same public entity laws that you are, even though they might not be subject to the same ed code laws. So for example, the Brown Act and Political Reform Act, those things are something that as publicly funded entities they need to be complying with and 
the information there either was either conflicting, where they say they would comply with the Brown Act, but the articles of incorporate or the bylaws actually had provisions that violated the Brown Act. So there was that you know confusion. Well, do they say they're going to comply with the Brown Act, but do they really operate this way? Um, and also the Political Reform Act, which has to do with conflicts of interest. They do have a conflict of interest um, statement in there, but again, it's more geared toward like a nonprofit would be rather than a public entity, and they don't have any acknowledgement that the Political Reform Act might apply. So from a governance standpoint, um, that, those were my concerns. Um, employee qualifications, I, I touched upon this. There is a concern about how all the teachers would have, would meet the highly qualified standard, which is required. Um, for M NCLB and state law compliance, um, given the program that they have presented, the courses that they say they will be teaching, and um, that, that was a concern, is how, how does that all work? And it, it didn't seem like it was, it would be very difficult, if not impossible, and if it were possible, it wasn't explained how that would happen. Um, there were also, in the suspension and expulsion procedures, a very, very, sh uh, um, small section on that. Again, it was, to my view, was not a reasonably comprehensive description of how, what the grounds were for suspension, what would take place, what are the due process um, requirements that would be followed, and so forth. Again, this is their governing document, and parents and students would look to this as they're signing this, this is what we're agreeing to, to say, what is governing this charter school? And there was a lack of detail there, and so I included that as a finding. Um, there were a couple other areas that were more technical in nature. I don't really think I need to review those. But um, just in summary, these are the findings that I found, um, that I developed based on input from staff as well as my own review, um, which essentially amount to areas of concern and uh, findings that would support a denial, if that's where you, um, if you chose to accept that recommendation. Does anyone else, have, do you have any questions for me at this time? Do you have, uh, if, if, if we deny this, if we accept, uh, uh, if we adopt the proposed finding of fact and deny the petition, uh, can the petitioner uh, go directly to the Riverside County Office of Education or can they uh, uh, correct these issues? and just resubmit? I mean, what, yeah. where do we they go? They have a lot of options, actually. Okay. I can explain those. Um, one is that they can, under the law, if it's denied here, they can then submit it directly to the County Board of Education. That's considered an appeal of sorts. Um, and it would be basically this petition submitted for their review. If the County Board approved it, they become the chartering entity. It's not as though that they um, overturn what you did and now you, it's, you know, it's, you're the granting agency. They would become the chartering entity. So that's one option. Another option is that they can look at this and say, you know, um, we want to make some revisions. We want to make some changes to the charter petition. And they can do that and they can resubmit here or they can submit directly to the county. But there are some specific rules that apply when you submit to a county directly as opposed to on appeal. One is that it's a countywide charter. It would have to have multiple sites and it has to meet a certain standard for that, like it really can't be done by a district or in one district. Or um, a charter that addresses, serves the kind of students counties would normally serve. So to me it seems like those probably would not work, um, but the appeal is, off, is, is an option that they have. Or they could make these changes and resubmit here. Excuse me. Uh, during your analysis, did you uh, have discussions with the petitioner, or is this just the analysis and you brought it to That's us? That's just my analysis based on what was submitted and meeting with staff. Nina, I have a question. If um, we were to approve the, um, their petition and uh, it wasn't successful, say the money became a problem and uh, it wasn't it didn't succeed, it had to fold and close. Would the district be liable in any way in terms of uh, monetary uh, investment or anything of that nature? Um, it's, kind of, it's kind of one of these it depends questions <laughs> that lawyers are answers. Um, charter schools that are incorporated as nonprofit public benefit corporations, which this one would be, um, do have a certain amount of autonomy. And because of that, the law says that um, a charter school of that type, there, I'm sorry, let me back up, that the granting agency, the district, would not be liable for the debts and obligations of a, a nonprofit corporation charter school as long as they've, com they've satisfied their supervisory responsibilities. So that would be the if. 
So if there was ever like, let's say, a lot, like, breach of contract or employee termination issues or they get sued for, because something goes awry, and this is whether or not they fail. I mean, this is just generally um, if a, a plaintiff wanted to make bring the district in, they would say that you didn't do your supervisory responsibilities properly. So it really would be very fact specific and what, whatever they would allege. In terms of them just going under and that sort of thing, um, I think it, it's basically, I think it would be very similar standard if there were debtors, for example, and if the district really didn't do, people would make the argument that the district was like say negligent in ensuring that they have, were dealing with financial matters in a responsible way, then the district can get pulled in as well. So it's kind of like, yes, you're supposed to be protected, but certainly there is a door open to be brought, um, pulled into that. The one area that you absolutely are responsible for is special education. So it, the law expressly says that the, both the charter school and the district is responsible for ensuring the kids are um, receiving their special education services properly. Yeah. Any other questions? Mr. Schaefer. Uh, uh, Mr. Swain uh, was quoted in the uh, Press Enterprise as saying, you're looking at the nuts and bolts. Uh, you have to tighten the nut pretty hard to make things work. Uh, what, what's your response to that? Nuts and bolts, I mean, that's what we do nuts and bolts and we also do big picture. I mean, I think this actually addresses both of those. There were a lot more nuts and bolts I could have put in here that were not in here. It doesn't talk about how, you know, well, internships aren't mentioned, you know, here, the, the facilities issues. I didn't mention here, but again, they're planning on building a building. They don't really say about a lot of detail about that and what's going to happen in their interim. They had one of two options. So nuts and bolts, yeah, there are some nuts and bolts in here, that is a con but that is a concern. The details are important. Um, but there are also some real fundamental concerns as well. It's not just nitpicking. The other um, quote that appeared in the paper was that, um, that what was listed by the district was easily fixable. And if that's the case, then I would assume that they could revise the petition and resubmit it uh, in a fairly, you know, uh, easy way. My perspective from looking at the proposal and from comparing it, you know, side by side with uh, the um, analysis that was provided by you and the district, I don't see it as being that easy, but, you know, that if that's the way that they perceive that they might be able to, you know, make it better. Yeah, there are some parts that are clearly easily fixed. They're just, you know, word changes. But there are also some pretty fundamental issues there. So it depends on how you interpret that, I guess, what's easily fixable, right? Any other questions for me? They have the opportunity to. And I'll be available if you want me to come back after that. All right. Mary, did you have any questions? Well, I had a, probably some comments. Um, before me, I do have all of that paperwork here. And before me, I have the, uh, our attorney uh, opinion, which seems to be very, very clear. And, and it concerns me that if in four years they failed, well, what they have failed is about almost 500 students. And that's irreparable. So I, I would hope that um, that they go to the county with a better prepared uh, document that uh, meets the needs of the criteria that the attorney has put forth. Uh, I did see uh, some in the paperwork that uh, upset me when I first got it, and our attorney seems to be verifying. It's a very visionary proposal. There's nothing wrong with being a visionary. However, uh, the responsibility I think the bus stops with us, and um, I'm not prepared to vote yes on this. This is a wonderful concept. We'd love to have this in, the, in our community for our students, uh, but we need the nuts and bolts tightened, and if the petitioner is speaking tonight, it would be uh, wonderful to speak with them, uh, but as it stands right now, I would hope that uh, as far as my vote would go, that if they could clear up some of these issues, and if they're that uh, simple, you know, just tightening the nuts to the bolt a little better, uh, uh, we'd love to see this in the community. Thank you. I, if I may also make a comment along those same lines. Um, when the petition was first presented uh, to the board about a month ago, 
um, I was very, very excited with the innovation that was uh, uh, built into the proposal and also with the um, potential opportunities for students to be successful who might not be successful in a traditional uh, schooling environment. I was also impressed, uh, you know, I've known the foundations and their work in the past, as you mentioned at, at your presentation last time, and I you know, did do, do some more research in addition to what you presented here that evening. So th the potential, I think, is there. It's just a matter of uh, putting together a proposal that, that's really more thorough and really addresses the issues that have been uh, brought out this evening, I think. Thank you. Okay, so. Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Com Hernandez. Comments. Well, first of all, I, I've been down there to where they've had that charter school before, and I've had relatives and friends that have attended an uh, excellent program. As far as the document that was presented to me on uh, Thursday, which was 200 pages, I have only had an opportunity to go through half of it. And I think uh, it was presented, uh, I was here when they made the presentation, and I was kind of curious why I didn't get that document once I was sworn in. Yeah, she said she had it earlier. Well, we got it before. Yeah. Yeah, that was before you were sworn in, Mr. Hernandez, and it was overlooked. But we do, I know where you're probably going with that, but let me, um, restate and Dina, if I'm mistaken, please correct me. We have two choices. One is to adopt the proposed findings of fact and deny the charter petition. And with that, if the charter wishes, they may return with revisions to our findings of fact and resubmit to us, or they can choose to go to the county with um, and ask the county to accept it. Or our second choice is to grant the charter petition and go with it as presented tonight to us. Are you for a motion? I am. Uh, well, I'd like to, to move the findings of fact be accepted and deny the petition. I'll second that. Okay, I have a motion by Mrs. Burns, a second by Mr. Mendez. Any other questions or comments? Student board members, do you have any questions or comments? All right, then we will. Yes, sir. You, may, you should have filled out a pink slip, but you may come up and respond. And if you could please fill it out when you're done and turn it in just so that she has the information. I apologize. No uh, problem. The process the last time you had us slotted in to speak, and I thought that was natural. And I'm sorry my voice is a bit um, gone. So uh, obviously we don't agree with the findings, but we understand that it's an innovative program and that it's very hard to judge how thick should I have made the book for you. Um, I would like to start by saying that it's innovative, but it's also proven. There are 55 big picture schools in, in the United States, 16 states. There are 10 of them in California. This particular nonprofit operates two of them. So two independent big picture charter schools. So it's not really hypothetical when we say this is our plan or that we say we can do a budget that matches a school or staff and complete A to G requirements, because we actually do that all of the time. So if the criticism is that the petition document itself wasn't enough to be convincing, I, I can hear that. But the reality for us is that we actually do this already. This isn't, we're not a new group coming in here saying we have a great idea, we go for the flyer, we actually do this. Um, I, I won't go through everything, but, and I don't know, frankly, what our strategy would be um, if you vote to deny. Uh, we would have to evaluate that. But I would like to illustrate a few points, and I'll leave you with a bigger document. Uh, actually only yesterday to, to work on this. Um, but I would like to illustrate some of the points. For example, 
the beginning revenues area called into question whether we would achieve our Title I, Title II, and Title III revenues. Well, let me tell you how I did the budget. We operate schools already with staffing models where we hire highly qualified teachers. We run integrated project-based education. So we know and demonstrate um, all the time that we have an educational program that actually does result in meeting the federal requirements. By the way, our, on another topic, which comes up later, it's typical in our schools, depends a little bit on the neighborhood that they're in, but the average and big picture of graduation rates is 92%, and 95% of those go on to call, get accepted into a college. Um, in some of our schools, for example, an LA school that works under me, we have had historically, we were in the area formerly called South Central, it's a very difficult group, and actually our kids were coming in with third grade reading level. That's what they tested when they got into high school. But still, 86% graduate, and a similar percentage of them get into college. So the, that kind of an issue um, we know and we perform in. Uh, in the revenues area, the biggest subjective area is, in fact, that I put in a significant startup fundraising amount. It's always a challenge when you're starting a charter school, do you put in the state's PCSGP grant, which at the time looked very speculative to me, and I didn't. And in fact, what we've done is worked with our um, Wath Tom Wathen Center partners and First Foundation and Investment and Banking Group, and we actually are completely confident that we will raise not only that much money, but significantly more. But in any case, what I didn't convey, maybe because it's too natural to me, but my board doesn't let me open a school until I have all the funding in place. So if we were delayed, which was the concern identified there, we would simply come back and ask, can we postpone the opening a year if we didn't achieve it in time? Um, it's actually possible at this point because the month is getting so late in the enrollment process, I might have done that even if we had the money because it might be a little late to hit enrollment targets. Um, when it goes on to expenses, expenses related to textbooks, custodial utilities look low compared to district experience. Many things look different than district experience. We're a charter school after all. So those numbers I base on our actual experience in other schools. I didn't make them up, but they're not a hypothetical. I actually looked up the data and said, what do we actually spend to achieve those functions? And that's what it was. Special ed, that's, that first I'm not really qualified <laughs> to speak about it. It's, too, it's not my specialty and it's complicated. Uh, but I can tell you what's typically happened. First in our budget, it's true, the, uh, the finding, proposed finding of fact that our expense matches the revenue number. It's absolutely true. We did that on purpose. Special ed in our other schools is actually handled differently school to school. It depends somewhat on the district and the local SELPA. A typical situation is that we negotiate with the SELPA a contract where, where the services we're defined are providing are defined and the services provided through the SELPA and the district are defined. And it almost always happens that the services we're providing match the revenue we're getting. So while I put in the full special ed money and then subtracted it all out, oh, I'm sorry. So um, just let me, um, so in general, let me just say, so in terms of the education program, we actually have data, we have students, we're proven that we run an education program that succeeds our schools actually succeed. We run our budgets well. We run our cash flow well. Let me just say that issue about not matching the state. We submitted this to you before the November election. The state changed its schedules after the, actually favorably. The budget, which we assumed it, that proposition would fail, passed. So our budget, if we restated it now, would actually be more positive than it was. A number of other technical things like governance and things they were. I th we operate fully compliant with all of those laws. The board has motions and policies that keep us compliant with them. 
one could ask, could it have been cleaner if they were all in the bylaws and not in a conflict of interest policy or something, but we actually act as if we were a public agency. We, are, we have other authorizers who review us on these facts. So in general, I've provided you with a document which I think does um, answer each question. It's not the same document I would give you if we were coming back or that I would bring to the county because I would have more than a day to work on it. Um, but I, I think if you really understood us and understood the details, you would understand that we actually are justified to be passed as a charter, that we do this kind of work, we have schools, we know what we're doing, and we would succeed. And thank you very much. Mr. Musley Johnson, I think you understand where we are coming from when we're making the decision that we are. I appreciate you um, putting together this paperwork. Um, but I think after our vote is taken, we would appreciate if, you know, it's easy to come up here and say, well, I would have done this, I would have done that, but we're, that's what we're asking for is we want the details, not just a generalization. If the budget was based on something, then we'd like to know what it was based on, not that it was just pulled out of the thin air. Well, I'm not going to sit here and argue back and forth. We have a vote to take, and we have a second, a first and a second, and stu roll call students. And board. President Schmidt? Yes. Trustee Burns? Uh, and that's yes to adopt the findings. Yes, yes. correct. Okay. Yes. That's just to adopt. To adopt the findings and deny the petition. Yes. No. Motion passes 4 1. Item C approved purchase of playground equipment and surfacing for Indian Hills Elementary School. Mr. Gill. Yes, ma'am. We have uh, deteriorated worn out playground equipment uh, at Indian Hills and it's becoming dangerous. We want to replace the play structure with new slides, climbing areas, and learning panels. Uh, what we have meets all ADA requirements and we're going to resurface, uh, put a new rubberized surface on there. We have pricing that's based on uh, Colton piggyback bid. David Bang and Associates can provide this for $33,779.61. The purchase is funded through, and we don't have the word, but I should tell you it's restricted capital outlay funds. And administration recommends the board approve the purchase of playground equipment and surfacing for Indian Hills Elementary School from David Bang Associates in the amount of $33,779.61. Move to approve. Second. Motion from Mr. Hernandez, a second from Mr. Schaefer. Any questions or comments? Student board members? Roll call vote. President Schmidt? Yes. Trustee Burns? Yes. Trustee Mendez? Yes. Trustee Schaefer? Yes. Trustee Hernandez? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. We'll be happy in the Yes, they will. <laughs> Item D, approve purchase of computers for Stone Avenue Elementary School. Mr. Gill. Yes, ma'am. We are asking approval for 19 HP laptops for students and teachers at Stone Avenue. You'll be seeing this throughout the year as you have last year where we're trying to replace existing computers and build up our supply of computers. The HP laptops proved to be a superior product that work in line with district curriculum and standards and the pricing is based on educational contract pricing and it's $20,502.19 it's going to be funded, the, this purchase, through restricted Title I funds. And administration recommends the board approve the purchase of HP laptops for Stone Al Avenue Elementary School from Hewlett Packard in the amount of $20,502.19.
A motion by Sha Mr. Schaefer, a second by Mr. Hernandez. Roll call vote, starting with students, please. Student board members? Yes. Yes. Trustee Burns? Yes. Yes. Motion passes 5-0. Item E, approve purchase of the instructional materials for special, special education students. Mr. Gill. A motion by Mr. Schaefer, second by Mr. Hernandez. Any questions or comments? Roll call, please. Student board members? Yes. Trustee Burns? Yes. Yes. Trustee Schaefer? Yeah. Motion passes 5 0. Item F Approve purchase of Apple iPads and related equipment for special education. We have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments? Mrs. <laughs> Collins? Yes. President Schmidt? Yes. Trustee Burns? Yes. Trustee Mendez? Yes. Trustee Schaefer? Yes. Trustee Hernandez? Yes. Motion passes 5-0. Item G, approve purchase of Dell Op Optiplex 710 desktops for Patriot High School. Mr. Gill. <laughs> Have a motion and a second. Roll call vote, please. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, Mr. Schaefer. These uh, Dell Optiplex, uh, these are desktops, and what we approved in item D was laptops. So are these uh, better, how should I say that? Do they have more bells and whistles than? The, the Dell, as far as desktops, we found to be a superior product and more compatible with our needs, but the laptops from Hewlett Packer now take the forefront and they're a better for us and more value for the price than the Dells are at this time. Okay. So we have two different laptops by one company and desktops by another. Thank you. But, they're, but they're all compatible for what we need. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, we had a motion and a second. Roll call vote, please. Yes. Trustee Burns? Yes. Yes. Trustee Schaefer? Yes. Trustee Hernandez? Yes. Motion passes 5-0. Item H, approve submittal of application for CDS County School District Code for California Department of Education CDE. Mr. Jabrowski. Thank you. We are interested in opening an online school. Um, Several districts around the county have done so. So we're not the first ones to the party, but we want to do that while it's, uh, we're, we don't want to be the last. Um, it provides educational options for students in a way that is sort of the way of the future. It's, a, it's an option that students are becoming more interested in. What we're asking of you tonight is step one, which is the uh, authorization to submit for a CDS code. We have to do that m far ahead of time to be able to get that code in order to be able to begin in August. We'll come back to you um, as we get further down the road for with more information. But the information available today, we, we plan to start in August for high school students, at least in year one, we plan to offer a hybrid program, meaning that the curriculum will be online, computer-based curriculum, but the students will be required to attend class on a daily basis, but for a much smaller amount of time. We've, we've found in the Odyssey where utilization that we've had over time in the summer classes where we've used online curriculum and in looking at the most effective programs that are out there if we just give them the computer software and send them on their way and come back for the test they're much less successful they need regular students need regular face time with a teacher for instruction assistance and and that seems to be the most successful option we plan to open it to 100 students next year as a max um, 
It will be housed at Harupa Valley. There is, uh, at the end of the student parking lot over by the track and football field, there is a, a building with four classrooms and some portables that is currently unused, so we plan to um, house it there. We plan to offer a program where students would take one class at a time one class per month. So um, in the month of August, they would be enrolled in, say, English 9. They would complete that class and then move to the next class. Uh, we would staff it with, in the beginning, the equivalent of two full-time teachers, um, some secretarial support, and, and some site support. The budget would be the typical allocation we give per student. Um, and we, we would like to name it the River, Rivercrest Preparatory School to set sort of a college-bound academic mindset among our students and, and attract those students who can be successful in an online curriculum and are college-bound. The classes would be, uh, we will seek A through G approval for those classes and um, more information to follow, but I can answer questions. You may have already said it, uh, stated this. How would the students be selected to participate in this program? We would uh, market and advertise, and it would be voluntary. Mr. Schaefer? Did you? Okay. I did. Okay. I did. Do you know what the, the cost is going to be for this online school? The. Um, well, there, there will be some startup costs that Mr. Gill will talk about. The, the typical ongoing operating cost would be, would be relatively low. The class size would be, because of the, the delivery model, um, this, it, at least as affordable or more affordable than in our comprehensive high schools. The teachers would come from, because it, it would be shifting of students. Students would leave our schools and attend this school, and so we would, we would align the, the allocation of teachers so that it wouldn't be an added new cost. Um, so I, that's sort of a round amount answer to your question, but it wouldn't be a significant ongoing expense because the buildings are there. Um, the teachers would not be an, an extra. Um, it would be secretarial support and whatever type of guidance coordinator, administrative support needed. So, um, And there's no cost for applying for the code? No. Applying for the code okay. is free. Okay. And then also, um, when did the board approve the online school? Tonight. Tonight? And we're going forward with this now. Okay. And, and really, you're approving tonight the submittal of the code, um, which, is, which is certainly revocable. As we get you know, further down the road and have greater details and are more ready to offer you more information, we would again, you would again have the opportunity to yay or nay. One, one partial answer, though. The board has approved over a period of time using the online curriculum in other places, like for credit recovery. So the curriculum in, in is already owned by the district and utilized in other areas. So, but that doesn't form a separate school. Correct. So how, how does Jolt and Odyssey we factor into the online school? Jolt and Odysseyware is, is currently being used at the three regular high schools for extra credit recovery opportunities for students who are low on credits but who spend the bulk of their day attending regular classes at their regular campus. The difference would be that these students would be completely enrolled in the online program. So that would be their school and all of their classes would be at the online program at the at the new school. Um, the same, we have the Odysseyware program, so we would utilize that. Um, that's not to say it might be the only, you know, online delivery system. Um, Odysseyware is really good in some areas. There may be some better, more affordable options. There are options that we can develop on our own using our own curriculum. So, so it, it, it would be one of the pieces of the puzzle in terms of online curriculum. So Mr. Gill is going to go over the, the, the cost, but what about, what about uh, uh, partnering with uh, a school district that already has an online program? I mean, uh, to save on cost. Uh, when when students, for example, I'll use Riverside Unified as an option because they have an online program. Um, students could attend that program, but then the the ADA would would go there, and they would be Riverside Unified students. Um, 
Riverside Unified, for example, was willing to provide us that program for a rather substantial fee, but then they would be utilizing their teachers and we would be sending them the revenue we generate for those students. We want to keep those students and we want to entice those students who may be considering you know, either alternative options outside the district or, or leaving our school district to stay and be a part of our district because we have this option that's, that's attractive to students. So because of the ADA, uh, everyone wants their own system. Well, we, we also can be um, the deliverer of that educational system, and we believe we deliver the best education of all the districts around us, and so we want to sure continue to do that. Okay. Just, just looking at trying and to save, save money, and we'll, we'll hear Paul's numbers. Let me jump in a little bit, because Paul's going to be talking about the facilities cost. In terms of saving money, we want to be able to, we're using a blended learning model. So we want the students to be able to attend the classroom experience. And this way they can do it within the district. And actually, I think as Mr. Dabrowski said, we believe this program in and of itself is cost effective. And the resources, I mean, we're using Odysseyware, but the resources in online learning are mushrooming every day. I mean, there's, there's a lot of courseware out there. There's a lot of internet support. It's not integrated in the courseware, but things like Khan Academy. And a lot of textbooks are becoming internet-based. So I, th I think what we're going to end up seeing, you know, if we jump down the road two, three, four, five years, is a whole spectrum from kids that are almost totally online to kids that are in classroom but still doing online anyway. And so I, I think part of it is as district, we want to be able to offer that spectrum. This at this point, we're not prepared to say that we want to offer students a totally independent online course because we don't really think it's academically effective, that to turn them loose would be good. We think the blended model of instruction works and direction is important. So I, I don't know that it's a matter so much of cost effectiveness, but the highest quality academic program. As Mr. Dabrowski mentioned, we have been in ongoing conversations with Riverside Unified. What they've developed is something very similar, well, maybe not similar, but analogous to Odysseyware, but they would either sell the software package or sell the instruction and, and you know, at their cost, which is going to be the ADA. <laughs> well, and, and when you think of the, you know, the three schools we have, say, you know, if we say there's 300 kids at our three high schools and, and three of them choose the online school and the next year nine of them choose the online school and you shift around the resources that you have at each of your schools so you're not incurring a big net cost because you have this many teachers to teach these students and a few of them are going to leave here and go here because the students left here and went here and so it, so it's not going to be a substantive new expenditure on an ongoing basis did that make sense And also, it keeps kids in their own community. It's not sending them, them outside of the community. And it keeps our teachers employed because the kids are just shifting schools. So there's a shift in the employees rather than having to cut employees because now we're sending all of our students to Riverside or some other. Well, a actually, what I meant was uh, partner with Riverside I was talking software, uh, you know, there's software and everything else, and I thought, you know, for a f small fee, right? you know, I'd rather get a small fee than no fee. And, and there are a variety, like, like Elliot had mentioned, a variety of options for software. There's courseware that's been developed by the UC system that's free. There's, we have Odysseyware. When we've talked to some of these providers in other districts who have done this for a little while, they say it's like textbook purchasing. You, ha you have to look for the best application for the class 
that you're offering. Uh, a credit recovery aimed curriculum may not be as good for, say, an AP biology class. You may you may want something else that's a little more high level for that, or you know, and you just you look for the best and most affordable things. And there's enough of a range out there that they're pretty cost effective. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I'm looking for to approve the submittal of the application for the CDS um, code from the California State Department of Education. Okay, I have a motion by Mr. Mendez, a second by Mrs. Burns. Roll call vote, please. Yes. Trustee Burns? Yes. Trustee Mendez? Yes. Motion passes 5-0. Item I is to discuss fundings, funding for Master's in Governance program. And last um, board meeting in December, I discussed the possibility of all of us, all five board members attending Master's in Governance so that we have um, a unified understanding or we're all getting the same information in the different areas of government governance and that CSBA provides a program. Um, it would be $1,600 paid up front per member and that covers all um, nine courses that are taken over a two year period and the first would be on March 1st and 2nd would be the first two courses. The second two courses would be um, uh, in October and so I'm looking for discussion. And well, can you jump out there? go ahead, Mary. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. With the economy the way it is, I'd rather see the eight thousand dollars be spent on computers. I mean, you know, I mean that's only my opinion. Maybe try it again next year, but at this time, uh, eight thousand dollars is a lot of money, and I don't know if we're are we that uh, ignorant in the way we handle ourselves up here. Or can we handle this for another year? I don't know. Maybe Mr. Deshawn would have an opinion on that. Which part? <laughs> uh, I'm going to do the easy one. I, I'd like to echo Mrs. Burns' comments. I, you know, I have attended some of these sessions as well as others by CSBA, and it, it's not a matter of ignorance of board members. It's a matter of just the depth of the job you all take on when you become elected. Um, it's and, and CSBA provides a, a wealth of support. There is, you know, all, all of us as professional staff um, go to job alike conferences all the time and, and this is the only, well, not the only, but it's, it's probably the only organized job alike training for school board members in California that reflects California law as well as sound policy and, and I think 
I, I doubt that you would find many board members who had attended who would not say in the long run it wasn't worth the cost to the district and it, it in the end it helped boards make sound economic decisions not not to say that you're not but as you look forward and deal with hard times and and it, I mean even hard times or better times or one way or another I, I just think the training is excellent it pr also provides a common language amongst board members and, and just a frame for the legal context in which you operate. Some scenarios cover the last where has there been a number of there is a 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 there is a
Thank you. All right, so I am looking for a motion or to let it. Oh, I will make that do, motion if you wish. Do, does I make a motion that the uh, uh, <laughs> board attend the Masters of Governance program as part of our required um, meeting. Thank you. Do I have a second? I'll second. We have a first and a second. And Mr. Schaefer, you had a comment. So the hostage taking, Mary's hostage taking <laughs> is what we're voting on. Yes. Right, yes, okay. Better than shooting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mary. I'm not going to repeat that. I might say that had you attended Masters of Governance, this conversation might be a little different. <laughs> I'm that serious about it because I believe that this is valuable for our every kid in our district, and I think that our teachers can uh, play better if we all uh, know what the basic rules are. I'm right there with you, Mary. I believe it's important too, but. I'm not going to hold people hostage that don't want to do it. So we have a motion. I, I know, I know. I know. I know. All right. We have a motion and a second. Roll call vote, please. Student board members? Yes. Yes. Trustee Burns? Yes. Trustee Mendez? Yes. Trustee Schaefer? <laughs> that was a yes, very quietly, Mary. Yes. Motion passes 5 0. <laughs> Thank you all. All right, item J adopt resolution number 2013 22, authorize the temporary transfer of funds held in any pro appropriate fund or account to the general fund. Mr. Gill. I have a motion. We have a motion and a second, but thank you, Mary. Um, Schaefer, motion, Mendez, second. That's fine. <laughs> and roll call vote, please. Student board members? Yes. Yes. Trustee Burns? Yes. Trustee Mendez? Yes. Trustee Schaefer? Yes. Trustee Hernandez? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. Item K. Adopt resolution number 2013-23, the resolution of the Board of Education of the Harupa Unified School District designating high priority capital facility needs, expenditures, authorizing the use of state matching funds, and authorizing related actions thereto. Mr. Gill. Second. Have a motion and a second. Roll call vote, or any questions? Roll call yes. vote, please. Oh, yes, I, I have a question. How much are we transfer? Uh, how much is this going to cost? I have it written right here, and I couldn't find it in the resolution. What we're going to yes, sir. No. Get out there. Uh, let Let me. I need to give you just a little bit of background on this first, as far as what the money is concerning. And uh, Mr. Hernandez, I think we went over this, but I want to make sure in case I failed to talk to you about it. This is money that was left over that we're talking about from Patriot High School savings, yeah. primarily. There There was a little bit of savings from from other schools too. Totaled about four million dollars. We have about $900,000 left in that fund. If you so designate this as a capital facilities need, then we can go ahead and use that money. Now, what we planned on doing was looking at the Family Services Child Care Center over on 42nd Street and using that as the online school. Up until about two weeks ago or so. The problems we found was nobody could f come up with plans that would show exactly what we had for that building. 
We have three portables over there, and there's one building. The DSA couldn't find the plans on it. We don't have the plans on it. Family Services couldn't find the plans on it. And the County Office of Education couldn't find any plans on it. We don't know if that building is field act compliant or not. The more we looked at it, and we looked at it with an architect um, and without charge to the architectural firm, but they thought the cost could be extremely significant. So we looked elsewhere around the district to see if there was another place that we could find. We just went over this past week to Harupa Valley High School because there is an awful lot of that facility that's underutilized. So. We looked at it, we decided uh, with, our, with our educators, with our facility people, with our maintenance operations people, with our IT folks, that we could do this and we could do this, we thought, at less cost than we could convert the family services building for. So only today we put together a back of the envelope and I'd be glad in the Friday letter to break down and show you what the back of the envelope numbers are, but I'll give you I'll give you some ideas as far as furniture, as far as construction, and as far as IT is concerned. The total amount would come up to roughly, roughly five hundred and sixty-seven thousand dollars. That breaks down sixty-eight thousand dollars for furniture, one hundred and forty-seven thousand dollars for all the IT equipment. That's that's putting everything in there. It includes all the cost of the laptops and the desktops, and 352000 for construction. Um, we need to put a sewer line in there. If we want to have that building isolated, we want to have our own separate bathrooms in there too, which, which is a fairly significant expense. And, I, and as I said, I only got these in. We had people working over the weekend to provide me these numbers so I could give them to you tonight. But uh, that's, the, that's the cost we're looking at. And now, if you compare that, if we're dealing with 100 students, and we're looking, although it's a totally separate operating cost to operate, if we wouldn't have this and we'd have those 100 students go elsewhere, today we're getting, um, it, with the new budget that the governor comes out, not today, but the 13-14 budget, $5,300 per student. So it would be $530,000 in ADA money. If you, if you could assume, and it's a big assumption, to assume that we take 100 students and send them elsewhere, the, the loss of that ADA is $530,000. All of this $567,000 expense is a one-time expense except for refreshing every four or five years or so the, the laptops and the desktops would be there. That's where we want to go to. So I hope that uh, answers your questions as far as costs are concerned. And as I say, the breakdown you'll have with the Friday letter. Well, I appreciate your, your presentation there, Mr. Gill. But I was merely asking how much money was left in the state matching funds that we're going to go over there. Over 900. I'm sorry, I thought you were. <laughs> okay. Well, earlier you talked about million. the cost you of construction. It started with 4 million, and then you went nine. All of a sudden, you started doing all these numbers. So it's 900? That's what we have left. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Schaefer. You, you say that you're, uh, you'll be able to use uh, underutilized uh, facilities over there uh, with uh, the building of new homes which they'll be breaking ground maybe this year or next year. How is this underutilized facility is going to look in two years? Will you need that back, and then what? No, I think it would be longer term than that, Mr. Schaefer. It's a, it's a great question, and it's one that I've asked. But I think we're looking at probably more than five years downstream for that. And um, at the rate we're losing students, you know, far and away more high school students are leaving the losses at Harupa Valley High School more than any other school in our district. So we can build back up. We had an awful lot more students there before. Some of the faci those facilities are portables. We can move other portables in and out of there. So I, I, I think we're good for a minimum of five years, but probably a lot longer than that, I think. I, I have a supplement to that question, Mr. Gil wasn't here when that school was over 3,000 kids. Not that we wanted to go there, but in terms of the long-range master plan for the district, we're really master planned for about 30,000 kids, and it would run at three high schools. When we hit over 30,000 kids, that it would only really be at that time we talk about a fourth high school or 
wanting to build smaller programs. So I, I think we have a long way to go. There's, there's a, the, it's a large campus also. So, um, and I think that it's a small portion of that campus and I don't think it would, it, well, would it affect it in a small way, not in a large way. One more item, Mr. Schmidt, if I, if yes. I could. We will be coming back to you, obviously, because of these expenses, too. You know, none of this has gone out to bid. This is just our own internal working um, numbers that I've given you. So we'll be, we'll be honing that down should you decide to approve that. I'll, I'll, I'll just give you the, the breakdown, though, on Friday. But, but please remember, it is an estimated back of the envelope without going out and asking people we'll be contracting to. But just to give you a feel for it, we'll do that. Thank you. Mr. Hernandez, did you have another question? No, I didn't. I'm sorry. Thank you. No problem. All right. So we are looking for a motion on. Oh, we have a first. Thank you. That was discussion. All right. So we have a first and a second. So we will take a roll call to adopt resolution 2013-23, the resolution of the Board of Education to designate high priority capital facility needs expenditures, authorizing the use of state matching funds and authorizing related actions thereto. Student board members? Yes. yes. Trustee Burns? Yes. Trustee Mendez? Yes. Trustee Schaefer? Motion passes 5-0. Item L, adopted a first reading, regulation 1230, recognizing parent organizations. Mr. Dabrowski. Thank you. We just added two booster clubs at Van Buren Elementary. Those are the only changes. Second. Here we have a motion from Mr. Schaefer and a second by Mr. Mendez. Roll call vote, please. Student board members? Yes. Trustee Burns? Trustee Mendez? Yes. Trustee Schaefer? Yes. Trustee Hernandez? Yes. Motion passes 5-0. Item M, adopted a second reading, revised board bylaw 9270, conflict of interest and exhibits, designated positions and disclosure categories. Mr. Duchon. Have a motion. I'll second. And a second. Roll call vote, please. Board yes. yes. Trustee Burns? Yes. Trustee Mendez? Yes. Trustee Schaefer? Yes. Trustee Hernandez? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. Item N Act on student discipline cases. Revoke and expulsion cases. We have two 12 065 and 12 089. Second. I have a motion from Ms. Burns, a second by Mr. Mendez. Roll call vote, please. President Schmidt? Yes. Trustee Burns? Yes. Yes. Trustee Schaefer? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. Expulsion cases, agreement, and stipulation. We have two 13 031 and 13 033. Second. Have a motion and a second. Roll call vote, please. President Schmidt? Yes. Trustee Burns? Yes. Trustee Mendez? Yes. Trustee Schaefer? Yes. Trustee Hernandez? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. Expulsion, suspended expulsion case, administrative hearing. We have one, case 13 025. Second. Roll call vote, please. President Schmidt? Yes. Yes. Motion passes 5 0. Approved readmission cases. We have 14, 09 137, 11 147, 11 151, 11 220, 12 024, 12 039, 12 044, 12 052. 12 055, 12 068, 12 074, 12 086, and 13 019. Have a motion and a second. Roll call vote, please. President Schmidt? Yes. Trustee Burns? 
Yes. Trustee Mendez? Yes. Trustee Schaefer? Yes. Trustee Hernandez? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. Denied readmission cases, we have 15. 09 228, 10 149, 10 211, 11 182, 12 015, 12 067, 12 070, 12 077, 12 080, 12 092, 12 101, 12 105, 12 106, 12 110, and 12 117. Move for approval. I'll second. Have a motion and a second. Roll call vote, please. President Schmidt? Yes. Trustee Burns? Yes. Trustee Mendez? Yes. Trustee Schaefer? Motion passes 5-0. Denied readmission and suspended expulsion cases, we have two, 12-091 and 12-093. Move for approval. I'll second. Have a motion and a second. Roll call vote, please. President Schmidt? Yes. Trustee Burns? Yes. Trustee Mendez? Yes. Trustee Schaefer? Yes. Motion passes 5-0. Denied admission cases, we have three, 11-157, 13-003, and 13-004. Move for approval. I'll second. Have a motion and a second. Roll call vote, please. President Schmidt? Yes. Trustee Burns? Yes. Trustee Mendez? Yes. Trustee Schaefer? Yes. Trustee Hernandez? Yes. Motion passes 5-0. Item O, approved personnel matters. Approved personnel report number 11, Mrs. Elzig. Thank you, administration recommends approval of personnel report number 11 as printed. Move for approval. Have a motion and a second. Roll call vote, please. President Schmidt? Yes. Trustee Burns? Yes. Trustee Mendez? Yes. Trustee Schaefer? Yes. Motion passes 5-0. Item P, appoint board representatives committee assignments. And that's me once again. And we had our annual organization meeting. And below you will find the committees, best of the best, Ms. Burns and Schmidt, budget Burns and Schmidt, career tech ed, Schmidt and Schaefer, charitable purpose foundations, Mendez and Schmidt, facilities, Burns and Hernandez, safe schools, Mendez and Schaefer and technology Mendez and Hernandez if um, there's something there that doesn't agree with you and you would like to give me a call we can look at it at a later point and Mr. Schaefer so we should give you a call on yes okay the, the reason I, I question is that this will be the third year on these committees On some of them, possibly, yes. Well, for me, it's a, it's a, it'll be the third year on safe schools and third year on career tech. Okay, well, give me a call and we can discuss. Okay. All right, any other questions or comments? All right, item Q, board member comments and committee reports. And Mr. Hernandez, we will start with you tonight. Well, thanks. You know, the new guy on the, on the board and, and the first one to go. Well, first of all, I want to thank staff for all the help they've been giving me. They've seen me a couple of times here at the, their offices. I want to apologize to Mr. Gill for giving him the question wrongly because I said how much it cost, which I meant was how much money was in the uh, uh, state uh, matching funds. But other than that, that's, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. I'd like to congratulate uh, all the winners of best of the best, but we do have the best of the best. I would also hope that uh, this uh, big picture aviation academy, that, uh, that somehow that uh, big picture schools of California uh, is able to uh, correct the issues brought up by Deanna Harris, uh, the district's legal counsel, it would be a wonderful opportunity for the students of our area to uh, 
uh, get into the aviation uh, industry, whether it's uh, uh, learning how to fly or learning how to put together planes or mechanics, whatever, it'd be a fantastic opportunity. And uh, they've got, if I'm not mistaken, reading in here, the, uh, the Big Sky has uh, uh, 110 schools worldwide, uh, 60 in the U.S. and 50 uh, through, uh, others throughout the world. And for them, to bring to us uh, the, uh, the concept here uh, that wasn't accepted by our legal counselor, we are not uh, educators and we are not administrators. So we go by what uh, our legal counselor, counsel advises. And I'm just, I'm just hoping that this opportunity does come back to us and that the students of the uh, Hroop Unified School District have uh, are able to partake of this opportunity. Other than that, thank you. I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry that I no, you're okay. spoke. <laughs> it was going down the line, I thought. <laughs> um, I echo um, my colleagues, uh, Mr. Schaefer's uh, comments in terms of the uh, proposal. I, when I saw, like I mentioned earlier in my comments, I saw a lot of potential for many of the students who might benefit from such uh, an opportunity in such programs that they would offer. Um, I, I believe, and I did, did look at the, the, what the gentleman mentioned in terms of the schools that have been successful, that have been established and in, in operation um, in other parts of the, of the state. Um, I wish that they would in, incorporate some of those specifics that they are being successful currently in other sites and incorporate that into their proposal and have us take a look at it again. Uh, and my last comment is that I'm truly appreciative of, uh, of my colleagues here and all of us uh, agreeing to attend the boardsmanship training. I really expect that will be a very positive experience for us and it definitely will bring a lot back that will benefit all of us to do a better job and uh, that will benefit, the, uh, turn out um, better decisions that we make here for uh, in the interest and benefit for our students, uh, our staff and, and our community. So I look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Burns. I love play ball. I really do. I hope that uh, my comments were uh, strong enough to let everybody know I think play ball and the stuff that they're offering really sounds good. In fact, I have a friend whose son was in that particular program. Um, I really hope that they put together a better proposal. But I also hope that our staff is one spending our money and our time uh, trying to help them rewrite so that it fits our needs. They need to be able to uh, write their program so that uh, uh, our attorney doesn't find so many flaws in it. So, uh, but I'm sure they'll get their act together one way or another. Oh, and I want to thank the fellow board members for agreeing to uh, do the Masters of Governance. It really wasn't my idea that everybody do it, but I think it's fine and I totally support it. Um, they're, they're, the interaction with other board members in a room, you know, you're in a room with maybe 50 board members, and they split you up and, and you just learn a whole lot. So I'm, I'm glad we're all going to do it, and you count on me to play and have fun doing it. Thank you, Mayor. Well, congratulations to all the best of the best. That was a great committee. Thank you, Mary, and congratulations to all the best of the best. And as Mr. Schaefer said, everybody is the best, so they're just the best of the best. And thank you for Masters in Government. I think it will be good for all of us to go and have a clear picture, all the same picture, and be on board with the same decisions. Um, and as far as the charter school, I think it's important to give our students a varied um, education these days. Not everyone fits into one pigeonhole. We're offering a lot, but I think they also um, need to realize that we need to see details. I know the staff here knows that before we make decisions, we need to see the details and the nuts and bolts and where the money is coming and going before we make any decisions. So if they choose, I hope that they come back and can 
match those details that we've asked them to provide. With that, thank you all for coming. Hope you are having a good new year, and we will see you next month.